Detective Chronicles respectfully introduce Mrs. Reed's Terror, a complete story by L.T. Meade and Robert Eustace. On a certain short afternoon in November 1893, I arrived home rather early. As I entered the hall, my servant told me that someone was waiting to see me, and had been waiting for an hour. What name? I asked. Mr. Reed, sir. I had known James Reed for several years. He was a person of some importance, and had been senior partner in the great house of Reed, Dundas, and Company, bankers of Lombard Street, but had retired from active business within the last year, as, after a severe attack of rheumatic fever, he had developed a serious heart affection. He often came to consult me, and I regarded his state as precarious, and had even told him that if he overexerted himself or received a severe shock, he might die suddenly. "'I am sorry you have had to wait so long, Mr. Reed,' I said. "'Now, what can I do for you?' "'It is not about myself I have come to consult you, Lonsdale,' he answered. "'It is about my wife. I have been for some time extremely anxious about her, and I want you, if possible, to come down tomorrow to Lakewood in order to see her.' "'I am sorry to hear she is unwell,' I answered. "'What is wrong?' "'That is what I want you to discover,' he replied. "'I cannot tell you how worried I am about her. She eats scarcely anything, stays awake nearly the whole night, wanders about restlessly in the daytime, and is getting dreadfully thin and worn. You would scarcely know her for the same fresh, happy, handsome girl you saw at the time of my illness.' "'I am truly sorry you have such a bad report to give,' I answered. "'Have you any idea as to the cause of this change?' "'Absolutely none. "'As far as I can tell, she suffers from no complaint, "'and yet something is worrying her to the brink of the grave. "'She is young and strong and has a good constitution. "'What possible physical disease, which apparently makes no sign, "'could yet bring about such an appalling and sudden change "'is what I want you, Lonsdale, to discover.' "'Reed spoke with great earnestness and with pain in his voice.' "'It sounds more like some mental trouble,' I said. "'But, of course, I can say nothing until I see her.' "'Mental!' he ejaculated with a start. "'What do you mean? Her family is as clear of that taint as my own.' "'You misunderstand me,' I said. "'I mean, by mental, some kind of worry or anxiety.' "'But what worry could she have? She should not have a care in the world. She has everything that money can give her. I deny her nothing. I am, as you know, a rich man, and her slightest wish is granted.' Sometimes I think that I have been overindulgent as regards money. I hardly dare say how much I have given her in this one year alone. Well, Lonsdale, you will believe me, I am sure, when I say that I would give all my fortune to restore her to health and happiness again. Has any other medical man seen her? I asked. No, she refused point blank to see anyone, and hence arises my chief difficulty. I was just coming to that point. I want you to visit us as if you were merely a guest. "'and while you are with us, try to gain her confidence, "'and at the same time watch her and form your opinion. "'I feel certain you will be able to discover what is really wrong.' "'But my practice!' I exclaimed in some astonishment. "'I cannot leave it just now, "'though I am much obliged to you for inviting me to come and stay with you.' "'He bent forward and touched me on my arm. "'Money is no object,' he said. "'Ask me what fee you like.' I will come at any rate tomorrow, and if I find I can get someone to take a few of my bad cases, I will stay with you for a few days with pleasure. Thank you, he said, rising. I quite see your position. You can do no more. I conducted him to the door, and he wrung my hand warmly at parting. It was easy to see that he was much upset, and he was in no condition to bear a mental strain just then. Full of curiosity and somewhat excited, I arrived on the following morning at Lakewood. My host met me in the hall. "'This is good of you, Lonsdale,' he said. "'Come into the drawing-room. My wife is there now. And,' he lowered his voice, "'don't make any remarks about her health. Act as if you did not notice the change in her.' "'You can trust me,' I replied. As we entered the room, I saw Mrs. Reed standing on the hearth. The day was a cold one, and a bright fire burned in the grate. She turned as I approached and came forward to meet me, I suppressed all signs of any special interest as I took her hand, but nevertheless I was truly shocked at her appearance. Her face, always pale, was now almost transparent, and her eyes, which had been remarkable for their vivacity and brightness, were nearly lusterless. Even the rich crimson silk she wore scarcely brightened her somber impression of illness and languor. "'So you have come to pay us a visit at last, Dr. Lonsdale,' she said. 
"'I am afraid you will not find us very gay. "'It is dull in the country, "'but perhaps the quiet will suit you after town. "'I always find town exhausting, don't you?' "'In a few moments lunch was announced. "'It was not a pleasant meal. "'Had I been a guest, merely, "'I felt I should have been even uncomfortable, "'owing to the loss of control exhibited by my hostess. "'Her movements were hurried, "'and as she raised a glass of wine to her lips, "'her hand trembled so much that she spilt half of it.' She would start, too, at the slightest noise, and even at the entrance of the servants. "'Well, Lonsdale,' said my friend as we were smoking afterwards, "'tell me what you think of her.' "'I am very glad I came,' I replied. "'Frankly, Reed, I do not like your wife's condition. She is certainly in a serious state of health, and the cause I cannot guess. But you can depend upon my doing my best to get to the bottom of this mystery, and I will not leave you till I have come to a definite opinion.' "'Thanks a thousand times,' he replied. "'I feel a great sense of rest and comfort now you are in the house. "'I am sorry that I must leave you this afternoon. "'Will you amuse yourself in any way you like best?' "'I left him, as he had business to transact, "'and went for a walk round the grounds "'in order to thrash out the strange problem before me. "'Little did I dream of how swiftly I should learn the terrible truth, "'and also all that truth's extraordinary sequel.' The next morning, when I came down, I was somewhat surprised to find Mrs. Reed in the breakfast room, as I thought, in her weak condition, she would scarcely rise early. I had just said good morning, when her husband entered, nodded to me, and began to open a little pile of letters on his plate. One of them, I noticed, had a foreign stamp on the envelope. Mrs. Reed, who was pouring out tea, kept looking from time to time at her husband. Her face wore an anxious and nervous expression. "'A letter from Cardwell, dear,' he said presently. "'He says he is returning home next week, "'much sooner than he expected, as he has finished his business.' "'Mr. Cardwell, coming home next week?' she exclaimed, "'in a voice which she was evidently trying to calm. "'She turned deadly white. "'She put down her cup, took up a piece of toast "'which she broke into fragments without attempting to eat anything, "'and finally, uttering some trivial excuse, she left the room. "'I glanced at Reed.' "'Isn't it dreadful?' he said. "'She is simply all to pieces. "'You must do something for her, Lonsdale. "'What can be the matter?' "'He had evidently not connected his wife's strange behavior "'with the words he himself just uttered. "'But I had observed her change of color "'and wondered if I was really beginning to get the clue into my hands. "'You must give me time,' I said aloud. "'I think I am just beginning to understand a little of her case. "'By the by, I heard you mention that a certain man of the name of Cardwell was coming back.' "'Do you allude to Frank Cardwell of the Foreign Office? "'If so, I know him well.' "'No,' he answered. "'The man I have just heard from is Sir Walter Cardwell. "'He is a great friend of mine. "'I do all his business for him, being his banker. "'He and my wife have always enjoyed each other's company, "'and I thought it would cheer her up to know that he was returning to England.' "'At this moment the door of the breakfast room was quickly opened, "'and Mrs. Reed's maid appeared. "'She looked alarmed, and her face was white.' "'Will you come up at once, sir?' she said, turning to Reed. "'My mistress has fainted, and I cannot bring her to.' "'Follow me, won't you, Lonsdale?' said my host. I sprang to my feet, and with fear at my heart followed Reed quickly upstairs. Mrs. Reed lay upon a sofa in her room. Her face was the color of death, and just for a moment I feared the very worst. I applied the usual restoratives, and in a few moments, to my relief, she opened her eyes. As consciousness returned, they wore an expression of almost abject terror. "'Is that you, Dr. Lonsdale?' she said. She held out her hand and suddenly grasped mine. "'You look kind,' she continued. "'I was studying your face last night. I am in terrible trouble. I should like to speak to you at once, alone. James, do you mind leaving me with Dr. Lonsdale for a little? He is a medical man and, and may be able to help me.' Shocked and startled, though he was, I saw an expression of almost relief on Reed's face, for thinking that his wife's trouble was physical, he thought she was going to confide it to me. As soon as ever we were alone, she asked for brandy. "'I must control myself,' she said, "'and I must get some strength back. I have something to tell you. I am going through a trouble which is killing me. Yes, killing me, Dr. Lonsdale. I have made up my mind to trust you. You must help me.' If you cannot, if you can do nothing at all, I shall take my life. I am in the most awful trouble. I am... Her voice sank to a whisper. 
I am in extreme danger of being arrested. I am a felon. Here she paused. Her lips had trembled so much as she got out the latter word that it was with difficulty I could understand what she meant. I am a felon, she repeated. A felon. She paused. I held some more brandy to her lips. She took a sip and continued. Unknown to my husband, my kind husband, I have been speculating and gambling. It is a passion with me. I can as little help it as a drunkard can help taking wine. Three months ago I lost over one thousand pounds on the stock exchange. I dared not ask my husband for so large a sum. He is generous enough to give me anything, but he could not understand what is the madness of my life. Instead of consulting him, I went to a man whom I heard of in the city. His name was Richley. I had no security. I forged my husband's name to a bill, and by degrees paid it off. Then I thought all was safe, and I demanded back the bill. But no, the villain still held it, and demanded another thousand pounds. He said that he had discovered that the signature to the bill was a forgery, and that he would expose me to my husband if I refused to pay. I was desperate. I could not pay. A fortnight ago I went to my husband's safe in this house, and took from it some bonds he is keeping for Sir Walter Cardwell, the man who is returning to England next week. Dr. Lonsdale, next week all will be discovered. Had he postponed his return for a fortnight, I might have redeemed the bonds. Now it is hopeless. Oh, my God, what am I to do? She ceased speaking, and for a moment I felt absolutely stunned, and scarcely able to realize the meaning of her confession. I thought less of her than of her husband. "'What am I to do?' she repeated. "'Have you no advice to give? I have ventured to confide in you, because you look so kind.' "'If what you tell me is really true,' I said gravely, "'there is only one course for you to follow. You must tell your husband the absolute truth, and without delay.' "'I dare not do so. I will not do so, and I forbid you to tell him. You know he has a serious heart affection. Any shock might kill him. He must not know.' Long before now I might have ventured to confide in him, but with the knowledge which you yourself so impressed upon me, that he must have no shock, that any shock might end his days, I dared not do so. It is true, I replied. Oh, why, Mrs. Reed, did you act in that mad way? Why does the drunkard drink? she answered. Why does the victim of morphia take the drug which kills him? My passion is for gambling, and when I have it on me I have no control over myself." I was silent. I had never felt more puzzled in the whole course of my life. You must tell me some way out of this terrible business. I cannot and will not ruin my husband's happiness. You will help me for his sake, will you not? For you are his friend. You would not like his death to lie at your door. Never in the whole course of my professional career had I come face to face with a more terrible situation. Mrs. Reed was right. Such a shock as the news she had just confided in me would produce upon Reed might cause his death. "'What latitude for action do you give me in the matter?' I asked at last. I spoke sternly, for I could feel little pity for the wretched woman. "'I give you all latitude, except that you don't tell my husband. You must get me out of this terrible situation.' "'What is the address of the moneylender?' I asked, producing my notebook. "'George Richley, 13 Rafford Court, Cornhill.' I wrote it down and left the room. I had already determined what to do. I knew if there was one person in the world who would suggest a solution, that person was my old friend, Miss Cusack. To her I would go, and at once. I saw Reed downstairs. He was full of anxiety. I managed to invent a story which I hoped satisfied him. Your wife's case necessitates my leaving for town immediately, I said. I must beg of you to trust me, Reed, for although I hope to give her relief, your knowing the truth at present would retard matters considerably. I spoke as cheerfully as I could, and I saw that he made an effort to be cheerful, although his manner was terribly downcast. Poor fellow! I could not help murmuring under my breath. However hard I try, he may have to know the truth before long. Still, if any human being can save the situation, Miss Cusack is that person. On reaching town, I drove at once to my friend's house, and as I did so, speculated as to whether she would resent my coming and asking her. For no one else but my old friend Reed would I have done it. Miss Cusack had once said to me, Dr. Lonsdale, if at any time my services, such as they are, can be of use to you, that is, in the cause of right, do not hesitate to come to me. 
My mission in life is to do good in my own way. These words now rang in my ears. But was this in the cause of right? Was it not right and just to all concerned to deliver a woman like Mrs. Reed over to justice? Nevertheless, for her husband's sake, I would save her. Telling my cabman to wait, I ran up the steps and rang the bell. The servant told me Miss Cusack was in, and the next moment I was shown into her presence. "'I am so glad to see you again,' she said, smiling. "'I hope you are well,' I replied. "'Yes, thank you. I have had a long rest from my special work. I feel at the present moment that I could do anything.' "'I am delighted to hear you say so, Miss Cusack, for I have come to ask for your help and also your advice in a matter which concerns the happiness of a great friend of mine, Mr. James Reed.' "'Mr. Reed, the banker? Yes, do you know him? His wife is in great trouble, and I have come to ask if you can suggest any way of helping me to get her out of it. What are the particulars?' As Miss Cusack spoke, she leant back in her chair, and taking up a tortoise-shell paper-knife, played with it as I told her my story. "'That is the situation,' I said, when I had come to the end. "'What do you think of it? Is there any conceivable way in which the scoundrel richly can be got to deliver up these bonds?' which Mrs. Reed has stolen, without the horror of a public exposure, which, in his present state, will doubtless kill her husband. "'Are you sure of that?' she asked. "'I am almost sure. Reed's life hangs on a thread. Any shock might put an end to matters as far as he is concerned. I persuaded him to retire from business for that very reason.' "'Then things are serious indeed,' was her reply. "'Of course, Richley's game must be stopped at once. Give me his address.' This is Thursday. Sir Walter Cardwell returns to England next Wednesday, you say? I have therefore five clear days. At present I hold out no hope whatever. It is not a pleasant business, and were richly not a blackmailer, the vilest of all vile people, nothing would induce me to have anything to do with it, for, frankly, I cannot sympathize with Mrs. Reed. But leave me now, please. My time is short. Little did I estimate the resources of that marvelous woman— the following afternoon a messenger brought me a note. It ran as follows. Go down to Lakewood and bring Mrs. Reed back to town. Have her at my house at three o'clock tomorrow without fail. Tell her husband it is a medical consultation and that relief is in store for her. Don't fail. I could scarcely believe the evidence of my own eyes as I read this note. A subtle scheme was in train. I had not the slightest doubt. On the following day I reached Lakewood by an early train. Reed was fortunately out when I arrived, but his wife was in. She ran into the hall as she heard my voice. In a few moments I had explained my mission. You are to come and see a friend of mine, one who may possibly, and I am inclined to think will, help you, I said. It will be necessary to tell your husband that you are going to town with me for a medical consultation. She overwhelmed me with thanks. I now went into the grounds where I met Reed and there I at once told him that in order to effect a cure for his wife's nervous trouble, an interview with a leading medical man in London was essential, for which I had made an appointment for three o'clock. The poor fellow's gratitude and delight were almost more than I could bear. "'A thousand thanks,' he whispered to me as Mrs. Reed and I were leaving half an hour later. "'I sincerely hope all will be well.' "'I feel sure it will,' I replied with emphasis." Mrs. Reed and I spoke little on our way to town. I was not inclined for conversation, nor could I give her my opinion as to the result of our interview with Miss Cusack. "'Where are we going?' she asked of me once. "'To the house of a lady who is a great friend of mine, one whom I can trust,' I answered. She pouted and looked dissatisfied. I turned away, not feeling inclined to humor her. Punctually at three o'clock we reached Miss Cusack's house and were instantly shown into her drawing-room." My excitement and curiosity to know what was going to happen were intense. Miss Cusack came to meet us. She was dressed becomingly, and I never saw her look brighter or more handsome. How do you do? she said, bowing in a distant way to Mrs. Reed, and then turning to me. You are both in good time, she said. I have only to beg of you both, and you in especial, madam, not to interrupt me in what I am about to do. Show no astonishment and dissatisfaction, I beg of you. Rest assured that all will be well. She had scarcely uttered these words before the door of the room was flung open and the butler announced Mr. George Richley. Mrs. Reed smothered a low cry and shrank back as if in uncontrollable terror, and I own I was almost as much astonished. Mr. Richley, a fairly good-looking, middle-aged man, bowed to each of us. 
Miss Cusack motioned him to a chair. Now, she said in her brisk, incisive manner, the business which brings us four together is easily explained. I understand, sir, she continued, turning to Richley, that you possess bonds value two thousand pounds belonging to this lady, Mrs. Reed, of Lakewood in Surrey, and also a bill supposed to be signed by her husband. What value do you place on these two properties? Ten thousand pounds, he answered insolently. And you have them with you? I have. Then please hear what I have to propose. "'Without any reference to the detestable trade you are practicing, sir, are you prepared to deliver up those bonds and that bill on certain conditions?' "'I will listen to the conditions, madam, before I make any further reply,' was his answer. "'To raise so large a sum at once is, of course, impossible,' she continued. "'I propose, therefore, to give you a written agreement, signed by myself and duly attested, to pay you the money in ten monthly installments of a thousand pounds each.' "'Miss Cusack!' I cried, unable to repress myself. "'I cannot believe this.' She was actually out of her own pocket going to perform this colossal act of charity for one who so little deserved it. "'I cannot and will not countenance the transaction,' I continued boldly. "'Mrs. Reed, have you nothing to say?' I turned hotly as I spoke to the cowardly creature beside me. "'Hush!' cried Miss Cusack. "'Remember you have promised not to interfere. "'Do you accept my offer, Mr. Richley?' You have, I presume, found my banker's reference satisfactory? The man's eyes gleamed with avaricious triumph. I have, madam, he replied, and I accept your offer. Once again I tried to protest, but was silenced by Miss Cusack, who sat down at her writing table and began to write. Kindly witness this, Dr. Lonsdale, she said, motioning me to her side. There was nothing to be done but to obey. Now give me the bonds and the bill, she said, turning to Richley, who produced them from his pocket. Miss Cusack, still holding her agreement in her hand, permitted him to read it. "'That will do,' he said, and the next moment the exchange had taken place, and Miss Cusack rang the bell. "'Go,' she said sternly, and bowing obsequiously to each of us in turn, he left the room, the butler following him. For a moment I sat literally stunned and incapable of speaking, for I had no words to express my gratitude at her magnificent act." She flung the bill on the flames and quietly handed the bonds to Mrs. Reed, who took them, muttering broken words of thanks. "'You can go also,' she said. "'And I recommend you, madam, to take this as a lesson. You can tell your husband you are cured.' Mrs. Reed glanced at me. Her whole face was changed. The look of cowardice had left it. It beamed brightly. "'You have given me back my life and reason,' she said. "'I shall thank God for what you have done to the latest day of my life.' "'And now let me at least hear that you have learned your lesson,' said Miss Cusack gently. "'Avoid gambling as you would hellfire. Go. "'Dr. Lonsdale, I want to have a word with you when you have seen Mrs. Reed into her carriage.' I accompanied my friend's wife downstairs, saw her into her carriage, and came back to Miss Cusack. "'What can I say to you?' I began. She interrupted me with a low laugh. I stared at her with amazement. "'You really think I was going to pay that ten thousand pounds?' she asked. "'He can sue you in any court of law if you do not,' I replied. "'That document is perfectly legal. You must know that.' "'It is legal now,' she replied. "'But it won't be long.' "'How? Why?' I cried. "'Do you mean to say you are going to destroy it? "'But he will never allow it to get into your hands again.' "'It will destroy itself long before the first installment is due,' was her answer. "'Dr. Lonsdale, I am not over-scrupulous in dealing with blackmailers. "'Come, the whole thing is simple enough. See here.' She raised the inkstand on her secretaire. "'Sympathetic ink!' I almost shouted. "'Yes, but something very refined and out of the ordinary in that line. A preparation of my own, a particular method of preparing iodine of starch in aqueous solution. It looks like, apparently, the best blue-black ink of the trade, and in less than three weeks not a letter will be visible, nor can any possible method restore it. That document which Mr. Richley took away with him will long before the month is up be a blank sheet of paper. "'Miss Cusack!' I cried. "'You are too wonderful. Nothing could have been more subtle. You are marvelous.' "'Not at all,' she replied calmly. "'I only use what brains nature has given me for my own purposes. I felt absolutely justified in doing what I have just done. I went to Richley yesterday and made the appointment. Of course he agreed to meet me here, and I referred him first to my bankers, to whom I also wrote, instructing them to inform him fully of my means.' You see yourself how completely I threw dust in his eyes. 
I apparently put myself absolutely into his hands. He saw how I should be at his mercy by giving him the document which he carried away with him. When he does not receive his check in a month's time, he will get out that sheet of paper, and then I leave the rest to your imagination, Dr. Lonsdale. He will come to see me, of course, and if he annoys me, I shall summon him. He can do nothing. His talons are clipped, for he cannot move an inch in the matter. The rest of this story is quickly told. Mrs. Reed got quite well. Her crime was apparently buried in oblivion, and Reed to this day believes that his wife is one of the most innocent and perfectly delightful women who ever lived. End of Mrs. Reed's Terror by L.T. Mead and Robert Eustace.